you have your Bibles this morning, go with me to the book of John 16 and beginning at verse 13. We've been talking about the cross being the defining line for really everything that's going on in our lives. And we are under the New Testament. We are under a new covenant. We're under a better covenant. And under this new covenant, under this better covenant, we are under the administration of the Holy Spirit and not the administration of Mosaic law through rule keeping. And what I'm going to talk to you today is I'm, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit, not an it, not something, but a person. The Holy Spirit has an assignment and a purpose to take care of, and he is the administrator of the new covenant. And so I want to begin a little differently this morning. Uh, a few months ago, I was in the house and the Lord told me to go to my office and just begin to write. And I didn't notice until uh, today that this was about the series that we're teaching right now. And so it can serve somewhat as a summary of some of the things that we talked about. But I want to read to you what uh, the Spirit of God dictated to me. And uh, then we'll begin to talk about the ministry of the Holy Spirit and him being the administrator and how basically we've got to learn how to trust in the Holy Spirit because the New Testament won't work in our lives without a trust and a faith in the, in the one who administrates it, the administrator of the Holy Spirit. So let me read this and uh, I pray it blesses you. Grace is not an excuse for bad behavior, rather a solution for bad behavior. Jesus died to set us free from the penalty of sin, but his death also made a way for us to produce better fruit and better behavior. Listen to that again. Jesus died to set us free from the penalty of sin, but his death also made a way for us to produce better fruit and better behavior. The issue is self-behavioral modification versus Holy Spirit behavior, behavioral modification. See, it's one thing for you to try to change and modify your behavior through your own self-efforts versus the Holy Spirit who has been sent to administrate behavioral modification and who will help you. You can't say under grace people have a license to sin more when in fact under grace and the administration of the Holy Spirit, you will sin less. The truth of the matter is self cannot stop sin or bad behavior. That's deception. Only Jesus through his grace can accomplish that other than then allowing Jesus and the grace of God and the spirit of God, that's going to be you trying to be righteous by the law instead of you trusting in the Holy Spirit to help you. Being free from the law of Moses doesn't mean that you are without morals. It means that instead of trying to achieve morality through the law or rule keeping, you will now achieve morality by the administration of the Holy Spirit. People ask me one time, should we even be using the word moral? What does it mean to be moral? It means to have a good character. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a Bible word. It means to have good character. It means to, to be someone who can bear fruit. And so you will now have morality by the administration of the Holy Spirit. And this is to everybody that's trying to be good without God. <laughs> This is everyone who has tried to defeat that and tried to overcome this and tried to overcome that. This is for the people who still don't understand that you can know everything the Bible talks about and still not be successful in everyday life. You need the Holy Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit to help you to be successful. I know a lot of people who know a lot of the Bible and still are not as successful as they, as they would like to be. Why? because you got to get to the point where you realize it's the Holy Spirit's job. The Holy Spirit's going to help me 
to behave right. The Holy Spirit's going to help me to overcome that thing in the past. And here's a good way to look at the things you go through in the past. Don't look at your past and look at it with condemnation and, and let it, uh, you know, uh, cause shame in your life. Look at it this way. I got over that. <laughs> look at the things that you've gone through and say, thank God I got over that. Don't let something you got over continue to beat you up for the day. I love what Taffy said uh, uh, at starting a service today that I'm not going to let somebody, you know, stay in, in my mind or let something stay in my mind rent free. So look at the stupid things you did, not to let it condemn you more, but look at those things and say to yourself, I got over that. I'm maturing and I've gotten over that. And the Holy Spirit is going to help you. So I'm trying to get people to understand now in this new covenant, it's about trusting the Holy Spirit to do the things that you've tried to do by yourself and you've not been successful. You've tried to, and maybe you've been successful for two or three months or two or three years, but that thing kept coming back. The Holy Spirit has been sent to give you a desire to do what pleases God, and he is your helper. He is your unseen partner. He is the one that will change you from the inside out. Oh, praise God. The Holy Spirit will change you from the inside out. Outward change isn't good enough. It's got to be inward change. Change has got to happen from the inside out. And so I continue to write. The Holy Spirit is the agent that changes bad behavior and gives you the desire to do what pleases God. We preach the fear of God as if you can achieve that without the Holy Spirit. We preach the fear of God like, yeah, it's going to be up to you to walk in fear and it's going to be up to you to walk in reverence. But what about all the people who have, have, I mean, who have tried with all their hardest to walk in the fear of the Lord and tried with all their best to reverence God? That's Holy Ghost infused. You need the help of the Holy Spirit to be able to do that. We shame people and condemn people by saying that their bad behavior is a result of not walking in the fear of the Lord. We've got to stop shaming people when they're not or don't seem to be as successful as we are, because if we could all look in the booth in the back in the corner and in the dark of everybody's life, you will find out that everybody got an issue. But for every issue, the Holy Spirit has been sent to help to change that issue in your life. Praise God. No bad behavior is a result of, uh, you know, bad behavior is a result of you know, refusing to believe Jesus and not submitting to the spirit of grace. It's not in the case, and, and you'll hear this this morning, of not believing. A lot of people believe Jesus, but they just refuse to believe on him. They refuse to trust him. They refuse to, to, to rely on him. Uh, when it comes to the, what you would call the little things in life, you don't rely on him to help you with a bad attitude. You don't Rely on him to help you to mature in your emotions. You don't lean on him to help you to be a, a better uh, mate in your relationship. And so it's not that you don't believe in Jesus. It's you're not relying on him. You're not trusting him. And, and, and he wants to walk with you every day. He, he, we've got to learn how to live an everyday life with Jesus, not just a Sunday life with Jesus, not just a church life with Jesus, but an everyday life with Jesus. The truth of the matter is that if bad behavior or sin means that we don't have the fear of the Lord, then since everybody sins and, 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 and don't behave perfectly all the time, uh, that same statement would be true for everybody, including one who accuses others of not having the fear of the Lord. And so Proverbs 9 and 10, uh, I want to read that real quick because I believe that certain things that happen are infused by the Holy Spirit. And verse 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Look at this in the New Living Translation. He says, Proverbs 9, 10, he says, fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. Now, this is all true. This is all according to God's word. Here's what I want to say about this. The respect and the reverence for God is Holy Spirit infused, not self-effort infused. We're going to have to trust in the Holy Spirit to help us to have that reverence. You know, the Bible says that 
we love because he first loved us. If we did not have the Holy Spirit pouring supernatural love on the inside of us, we would not be able to love some of the things that we've chosen to love. And I want you to know that and want you to see that life in the New Testament is not going to be the way Jesus wanted it to be without us trusting in the Holy Spirit. Well, do we just sit around and do nothing? Are you telling us just to believe God? Listen, while it's true that the works of God is to believe, it is also true that the Holy Spirit will lead and guide you into what to do, when to do, and where to do it. If we are, if we are doing what he, he's leading us to do, then we continue to be faithful to the last thing he told us to do and be ready to adjust our doing as a result of following his direction. So we rest while doing or working. We're not resting from doing or working, but while we do and while we work. And then finally I wrote, we know that there are things that have to be done in the natural. And we depend on the Holy Spirit to direct our lives in the natural, going to work, to direct our lives in the natural, paying our bills, providing for our family, raising our kids. So we're not telling you that there's no work. What we're trying to get people to understand is that after you learn about the grace of God, after you learn about the difference between the Old and the New Testament, here's where, it's, here's where the rubber meets the road. Now that you know these things, will you allow the Holy Spirit to come and do only what the Holy Spirit can come and do? Some reason, I think people think that they, are, they can be successful if they just continue to get a bunch of knowledge. And listen, in all you're getting, get understanding. But even with all of the knowledge and even with all of the understanding, will you come to a place where you will trust, depend, and rely on the Holy Spirit to get you there? So that when it's over with, you can say, like some of the people of old have said, this is the Lord's doing. And it's marvelous in our eyes. That's what you should be working towards. It's being able to say that all the things that have been done in my life, all of the corrections that have taken place in my life, all of the things I no longer desire, all of the great things I now desire, all of the things that I've gotten over with, that I don't, I don't have that, that issue no more. At the end of the day, he should get the praise, not you. He should get the praise. It's not because of your your, your, your life coaching. It's not because of your self-preservation. It's because one day you decided, I'm going to trust the Holy Spirit. I'm going to trust him. And I'm going to go to him and I'm going to take everything to him. I'm going to take my bad attitude. I'm going to take my condemnation. I'm going to take the way I treat people. I'm going to take my anger and my hurt and my brokenness and my fear. And I'm going to go to God every day and say, Lord, help. Lord, I trust you. Lord, I need you. And then through that process, you begin to see the administrator of the New Testament causing things to change in you. And you will lift your hands up and say, how great thou art. And truly now, truly now, you will know what it means to have a real relationship with God through the Holy Spirit, knowing that you depend on him for everything and not on your intelligentsia, not on your latest revelation. You're depending on the Holy Spirit, the agent of change to come and to make it so in Jesus name. I pray you got a hold of that. Amen. So let's begin. Let's uh, uh, go back to John 16, 13. Let's learn about the Holy Spirit. Let's learn about the administrator. Let's let's learn more than what we've learned in traditional church that if it was left up to just some of that knowledge, the Holy Spirit is just, you know, the agent that causes you to shake, rattle, and roll. <laughs> if it was left up just to the knowledge of tradition, you know, the Holy Spirit is, 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 you know, he does all of this other stuff, and we don't understand the Holy Spirit is the, the administrator of this new covenant that Jesus shed his blood and gave his life so that we can have access to. So without the Holy Spirit, the manifestation of the new covenant 
is going to be very hard to achieve. He is the agent that, is de, that has been appointed to help you to bring this to pass. Now, let's look at John 16, 13. It tells us something. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come? Well, has the Holy Spirit come? Yes. When he, the spirit of truth. Now, notice what they refer to the Holy Spirit as the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth. When he will come, he will guide you into all the truth. Praise God. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Every Christian under this new covenant should not be in the dark. The Holy Spirit will show you things to come. So notice here, he's not just here to, so you can shake, rattle, and roll. He's going to show you some things to come. It is imperative that we develop a life trust, living this life with the Holy Spirit. Now go with me to Titus chapter 2 and 11. And these are just four scriptures I want to share before we start so you can understand that the Holy Spirit plays a, a, a very important part in changing us from on the inside, but he needs us to trust him. In uh, verse 11, he says, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. That means that what Jesus did, he did for everybody, for whether you're saved or unsaved, he did it for everybody. It's available to all men, verse 12. And notice what happens here in, in Titus 2 and 12. He says, the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men, and notice what he does. He will teach us to deny ungodliness. He'll teach us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, and that we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. Well, I can imagine us trying to accept that responsibility without the Holy Spirit. It's not going to happen. But when you trust the Holy Spirit, he's going to teach you. Somebody says, how does he teach you? You have that personal relationship with him every day. He's going to teach you. He's going to change your desires. And you're going to recognize that the thing that you used to want to do, you're not going to want to do it anymore. He's going to teach us that denying ungodliness. He's going to, listen, he'll teach you how to deny ungodliness. He'll teach you to deny ungodliness. Think of that. Think of that. How is it that we get over in the new covenant and we get under grace and we don't even recognize that denying ungodliness is one of the benefits of being under grace and the spirit of grace, the Holy Spirit, is going to work with you to deny ungodliness. I don't know how many times ungodliness knocks on your door, but everybody has an opportunity every day to follow the Holy Spirit. He'll lead you away from it and start teaching you to deny it, rejecting it. He'll teach you how to say, no, I don't want that. Uh, right now, you may want it. Uh, throughout your life, you have made, always wanted it. And what do you do with a person who says, I'm saved, but I don't want the Holy Spirit teaching me these things. I just don't want to do it. Yeah, I know it's right to do that. I just don't want to do that. Wow. And so you are a free moral agent. You have a right to decide that you don't want the Holy Spirit to teach you. You have a right to decide that you don't want to deny godliness, and then you proceed in it. You have a right to decide, I don't want to deny worldly lust, and you can just continue to do that. You have a right to decide, wait a minute, I don't want to live soberly. I don't want to live righteously. I don't want to live godly in this present world. You can decide that, and all of heaven will back up and honor your decision. Because you are a free moral agent, you have a right to make a decision. You make a decision, good or bad. Decision is the open door into reality. It will become real, the blessing or the curse, once you make the decision. The Bible said that and gave us a hint. He says, I've placed before you life or death. I've placed before you a blessing and the curse. He says, all of these things are placed before you. I placed before you uh, 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 holiness and I placed before you wickedness. I placed before you all of these things. All of that stuff is before you. You know what? You choose. He says, and I will not take that away from you. He says, I'll give you a hint. Choose life. And when you choose right, you're going to live right and it'll be a blessing to your family. I, I think we're living in a world right now where we're busy blaming the devil for stuff instead of looking at the individual choices that people are making. You are a free moral agent. Nobody's making you do something you don't want to do. You remember uh, years ago there was this show, the Flip Wilson show, and he played the part of a, of a woman, Geraldine, and, 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 and the, the little thing used to come up and say, the devil made me do it. The devil can't make you do something you don't want to do. But here's, tr here's the truth also, neither can God. God's not going to make you do 
what you don't want to do or what you don't choose to do. And the devil can't make you do what you don't want to do. What you, you have a choice. Life is a series of decisions. And you got to check out how you're deciding. Enough of this blaming everybody else for what you do. Enough of you blaming everybody else for how you came out. Enough of you continuing to go in your past and finding crutches and using those crutches to try to justify why you are the way you are. Because God is greater than all of those things. He's greater than your past. He's greater than what you got and what you didn't get. He's greater than your pain and no pain. He's, God's greater than all of that. And what God is saying, if you just make a decision and just trust me, I can help you change. And I can help you be what you ought to be. I can help you to be the thing that will unlock the doors and allow the blessings to flow in like a mighty river in your life. If you're depressed today, you know, somewhere along the line, you chose it. Just like Taffy said, see to it that you be not troubled. That was a choice. You, have, you can see to be not troubled or you can see to be troubled. It's a choice. And we got to accept responsibility for those choices, choices that are in our lives. Look at Romans chapter 5 and 5. Romans chapter 5 and 5. And I know this is a long foundation, but hey, if I just preach on foundation today, it'll be cool. I'm, I'm learning not to rush to try to finish a message just preach what, where I think the Spirit of God is, which is more important right now because you're not here and I'm not where you are. And so I have to trust the Holy Spirit to minister to you. I can't see your face. I can't see you making faces. I can't see you getting up, walking out because you don't like what I'm saying. I can't see none of that. But the Holy Spirit is present and I, I, I have to have him. I have to have him. It's just amazing to me. I am preaching up here by faith that somebody is listening on the other side. I am preaching by faith that somebody who needs this is on the other side. And I can't tell you what it feels like just in the natural when I finish preaching, wondering, was anybody on the other side? Did anybody hear what, what I was saying? Did, how's the Holy Spirit working on the other side of this, this camera? And I have to believe that and I have to trust that. And I have to wake up every day living my life to trust him. Look what he says. He says, and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. There's, there it is. The Holy Spirit pours supernatural love into our hearts, giving us the ability to love beyond our natural ability. And some of you who have decided to get a pandemic divorce and, you know, you made a decision to do that. And after the divorce is final, you're going to look and, and, and check it out. It's going to be something real small something that you could have dealt with, something that you could have handled, something that the Holy Spirit could have easily resolved in you. There was a challenge that took place in the pandemic, and that challenge was an opportunity for great change. There was a challenge that took place in the midst of, 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 of financial situation, and that challenge was an opportunity to produce great change. You had an opportunity to deposit wisdom into your wisdom account but we keep running away from those opportunities to change. We keep running away from the challenge. We keep running away from the things that confront us in life. And life is all about those confrontations and those challenges so that you can get stronger and so you can be built up in your faith and so you can be built up to trust God. I'm talking to somebody. I can't see you, but I'm talking to somebody. And maybe right now you're tempted to turn the stream off because I'm challenging you. Maybe you're tempted to, I don't want to listen to this anymore because it was so cool for you not to accept responsibility for your decisions. And it was so easy to blame everybody else, including the devil. And now I'm telling you that at the end of the day, even the Holy Spirit can't do anything without you making a decision to invite him in and to allow him to be a part of your life. Romans 5 says he's poured that love, supernatural love. That's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's trying to equip you. The Holy Spirit's trying to do everything he can so that you can live the life that's pleasing to God. So you can do the things that'll be pleasing to God. God's not gonna ever ask you to do what you are not equipped to use to do it. He's not gonna do it. If the Holy Spirit talked to you about forgiveness, he has poured and equipped you with supernatural ability to do it. But, if you allow your emotions to have the control over your life that the Holy Spirit should be having over your life, then your, your immature emotions have become your guide 
rather than the Spirit of God becoming your guide. So what's leading your life? Emotional immaturity or the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the one we've got to trust. Now, let's look at John, John chapter 16 and, and verse 8. And, and I'm going to make some adjustments in some of the things that I've said in the past to bring more clarity to, to what you've heard in, in times past. John 16, verse 8, he says, And when he, and that he's referring to the Holy Spirit, when he is come, he will reprove, convince the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Now, I want you to pay attention to something. The Holy Spirit doesn't come, that word reprove or convict or convince. He says, and when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. The Holy Spirit doesn't convict people, listen to this, of things they do that are wrong. That's what I thought. The Holy Spirit does not convict people of the things that they do that those things are wrong but of the fact that they are not believing on Jesus or, here's why I want to say it, he's, he's trying to convince them that your issues are all involved in your refusal to trust, rely, and believe on Jesus. In other words, he has not become a part of your everyday life. And so those things that are happening the Holy Spirit is trying to convince you whether well, it's happening like that because you refuse to trust God. You, re you refuse to, 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 to believe Jesus for that. You refuse to believe Jesus for your provision. You refuse to believe Jesus for your health. You refuse to believe Jesus for your protection. Do you know that's the reason why a lot of stuff like that is going on with people? They won't believe Jesus. And think about the world we're living in right now. They're not, they're not believing Jesus. You know, you don't have a job. And then you go through stuff because you refuse to believe Jesus. You know what it means? You know, you know what it's called when you refuse to believe Jesus? It's called disbelief. Disbelief is your refusal to accept and to trust and to believe Jesus. It's a refusal to believe or to accept something as true. I won't believe it. I won't accept it as true. I just don't believe that Jesus can help me in this finances. I can't believe that Jesus can help me when I'm depressed. I just can't believe Jesus can help me in my relationships. And you wonder why people go through stuff, and I'm talking about even Christian people, because they refuse to rely, trust, and lean, and believe on Jesus in their everyday situations. And you know, I look at, I look at other people who, who believe in, I mean, as soon as something happens, they're turning and talking to Jesus. They're turning and trusting in Jesus. They're turning and relying on him. And do you know if you'll take those people versus other people, these people always end up just fine, always end up all right. It's not, it's not a big, gigantic check that fell from a cloud and entered into the mailbox, but they always seem to turn out all right because of their reliance upon Jesus. It's one thing to call yourself a Christian when you come to church, but when you leave the church and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday come, what's that relationship like between you and God? What's that relationship like? Who are you turning to first? Who has priority in your life when you get in trouble? Are you turning to Jesus or are you turning to the government? Are you turning to Jesus or are you turning to self-preservation? Who, who are you turning to? Simple message, but it's a wake-up call this morning. Because I'm telling you right now, life is not the way the New Testament says it should be for a lot of Christians because the Christian people are not believing. The Christian people are refusing to accept as truth that this administrator can help us in every area of life. Holy Spirit is a game changer. He is a game changer. And to be ignored to ignore what Jesus has done, to ignore the blood of Jesus, to ignore him dying so that we can have these rights and privileges, so that he sent the Holy Spirit back to us. He sent him. The Bible says he sent the Holy Spirit to us, and we just don't pay him any attention at all. So the thing that 
just, just really blesses me is that Holy Spirit's not trying to convict you of the wrong you're doing. The Holy Spirit is trying to convict you of the fact that somehow, some way, you're not believing on Jesus or you're not, yeah, you're not believing on Jesus. You're not accepting Jesus. You're not trusting Jesus. That's what the Holy Spirit's trying to do. He's trying to do that with everybody. He's trying to get you to the point, will you accept what Jesus has done? And I mean, what a, what a tragedy to have Jesus to have done everything that he's done for us and we don't even accept it. We refuse it. And then we rely upon ourselves to achieve. And that's going right back to the greatest sin in the Garden of Eden, trying to be like God without God. Let me give you a few examples of this because I want to make sure you understand what I'm saying. The Holy Spirit will not convict about your, about your lack of giving, but he'll convict you about your lack of trusting Jesus with your finances. So we think, well, I'm convicted because I didn't give or I'm convicted because I've given in a long time. Now, what the Holy Spirit's going to do is, why is it that you don't trust God with your finances? He's getting to the root of the thing. You're thinking he's just busy trying to make you feel bad. He wasn't, he wasn't sent to just make you feel bad. Oh, God, I feel bad. I should have did that. No, no, no. That, that what the Holy Spirit wants to do is, uh, why is it that you don't trust Jesus where your finances are concerned? What, won't you trust Jesus where your finances are concerned? Now, so we're coming to a time right now, and I thought about this earlier. We're coming to a time right now where people are losing their jobs. <sighs> they don't have money to pay their bills. They don't have money to, for, for food. You know, thank God for this church. We feed people twice a week. Yesterday, Thanksgiving was cars all over the place. We're going to be there. Our, our job is to make sure we love and minister to people. We're not going to get into the debates of the world. There are too many people that need to be loved. There are too many people that need to hear the gospel. There are too many people that need to be cared for. We just decided we're going to do what Jesus does and let everybody else do what they believe they're supposed to be doing. And that's, not, not, that's no shade towards anyone. I'm just saying this is what God told us to do. But, you know, man, it's, it's the fact that what about Jesus? Why won't you trust him? Why don't you lean on him? And so they're going to need jobs. And this is a great time for you to know that you can trust Jesus where your financial situation is concerned. And, you know, there are some people who say, I know I can, but it's got to be more to it than that. Well, it'll, it, I, I know it's going to start with that. If you just start with that, then he can, he can do some stuff. He can do some amazing things. Who have ever thought that during the pandemic, some of you have had some of the most outstanding promotions and increases on your jobs, and some of you started new businesses in the midst of the pandemic, and some of you have just been financially sustained in the midst of the pandemic. Why? Because you chose to trust God. And so why not trust him now? Okay, the job dissolved. Why not trust him now? Okay, how you going to pay the rent? All your money spent. A little bit to buy some food. Baby need a pair of shoes. I'm going to tell you how to do that. Receive the conviction of the Holy Spirit and trust God where your financial picture is concerned. So Jesus is not coming to make you feel bad for not giving. But where he wants to come is to convince you that you can trust Jesus where your financial situation is concerned. But let's, let's do some more uh, examples of this. This is big. Uh, all acts of sin come from the one act of not accepting and trusting what Jesus has made available. That's big. All acts of sin comes from the, act, the one act of unbelief or disbelief, one or the other. Unbelief or disbelief is going to be the foundation for every act of sin. Not believing and not resting in the relationship with Jesus Christ. That's a big thing. You, when you think about it, when you do sin, you're sinning because you're not trusting and relying on the relationship you have with Jesus Christ. And this New Testament is all about your reliance on your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Adam and Eve's sin wasn't eating the fruit, but it was not believing in the goodness of God. <laughs> Something else happened there. God said, you can eat of all the trees of the garden, but don't eat of this one right here. So the sin wasn't 
that they ate the fruit of the tree. The sin was they refused to accept the goodness of God that they had ever. You can eat of all. Can you imagine the number of trees that were in that garden? You can eat of all the trees of the garden. And that was the big sin there. They accepted the lie that God had withheld something good from them. They doubted God and they believed the devil. Look at Genesis 3 and 5. They accepted the lie that God had withheld something good from them. And you know, a lot of people today are accepting that lie. God is withholding provision from you. God is withholding healing from you. God is withholding peace from you. God is withholding happiness from you. That's a lie because you haven't accepted the goodness of God. God is good and God wants to do you good and make you happy. The goodness of the Lord has been given to cause a man to repent, to bring a man to change his mind. So what God's going to do is say, I'm going to show you goodness so we can change your mind about some things. Look at this in the Garden of Eden, verse 5. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open and you shall be as God's knowing good and evil. They, did, they believed the devil more than they believed God. And in this day and time, you believe your immature emotions more than you believe God. You believe the norms and values of the world more than you believe God. You believe what they say on social media more than what it says in the word of God. That's where we are, ladies and gentlemen. And so you move down to David, look at David's life. In Psalms 51 and 4, if you'll flip over there, David said, and this is so interesting, he says, against thee and thee alone, uh, in verse 4, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. And I always wonder when he said, Lord, it, 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 my sin was against you and you alone. And, and he said it again over when in, in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 12 and 10. Uh, he said, now therefore the sword shall never depart from thy house because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah at the Hittites to be thy wife. And he talks about that was a sin against God and against God alone. So what was the sin against God? The sin was I did not trust and rely on you. I got into self-preservation. I wanted to please myself. I mean, even God even said, you know, if, if you would wanted another mistress or however you said that, that's a weird thing for me, but he said, whatever it was that you wanted, all you had to do is ask me and I would have gave it to you. He would not rely on God. And so what happened when you go into self-preservation, you deny trusting and relying upon God. And that's what we're doing every day under this new covenant. We're, we go, we'll go so far in trusting God. And then eventually throughout that process, we go back to self-preservation. And that doesn't work. That's the sin between you and God, the sin of, of not accepting his goodness, the sin of not relying upon his relationship, the sin of not believing him as Jehovah Jireh, the one who will provide and take care of you. And I think the greatest temptation of what I'm preaching on is about to happen because people get into a panic and panic is groundless fear. And all of a sudden you're, you know, you find yourself saying you trust God, but then when the opportunity for self-preservation to come, you forget all about God and you go down that road of not trusting him. And God is through the Holy Spirit is going to convict you to say, wait a minute, what about me? What about me? Look at Genesis chapter 39 and 9. You know, the Lord said to David in 2 Timothy Samuel that when David committed adultery and murder, he had despised God. And the root of David's sin was against God. It wasn't against Uriah. It wasn't against uh, Bathsheba. It was against God. And a lot of the sins that show up in our lives, it, it's not the sin that we committed against that person. It was, I didn't rely on God. See, if you're going to be a real, for real Christian, then what I am preaching on now is paramount and must take precedent in your life. Look at Genesis chapter 39 and 9, Joseph dealing with uh, 
uh, his master's wife. He said, there is none greater in this house than I. And, and, and you know, the, 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 let's look at verse 8. I want to read into verse 9, uh, Genesis 39, verse 8 and 9. He says, but he refused uh, uh, and said unto his master's wife, behold, my master wanted not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath. He's committed it into my hands, verse 9 to the point but that there is none greater in this house than I because of the authority that's been given to me by the master. He says, neither has he kept back anything from me but you because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Isn't that amazing? He called the sin a sin against God. What he's saying was, how can I go ahead and accept this pleasure and not accept and trust and believe that my God can grant me this, that my God can be responsible for this. And he says, if I do this, I do this not trusting in him, but I do this on my own to bring myself pleasure. That was a, a revelation to me to think that, wait a minute, it's, it's when I step away from God in trust, if I step away from God in belief, if I step away from God and he's my source, and he's the one that meets all of my needs. He's the one that will take care of me. But I just, I don't know what it is about, about, about say, folks, we, you know, we just can't simply rely and trust on him. And the celebration is much better when you, when you, when you know you trust God for the whole thing. I'll tell you one thing, some, sometimes people want to do it in their timing, and God knows that your timing is the wrong timing because you're not as prepared as you think you are. And you're asking God for stuff that he knows you ain't ready for. And I've seen people do that. They worked real hard and got some of it, but it destroyed them because they weren't ready, because they were not mature enough. Maturity uh, for a Christian, man, that's going to, maturity and emotional immaturity, they're going to work together because your, 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 your emotional immaturity will be corrected by your maturity with God. And the more you are trusting and relying on God, that's, that's, that's mature. A Christian who knows how to stand and believe and rely and trust God, that's spiritual maturity because then you can begin to produce the fruits of spiritual maturity. But don't nobody want to hear that. That's church stuff. Until you get so messed up, so, so, so everything you have tried just doesn't work. Everything that you've done only lasted for a while. I don't know about you, but I don't want to live my life from miracle to miracle. I want to live my life in perpetual blessings where those blessings go from one blessing to another blessing to another blessing. And it is not my responsibility. You know, somebody says, well, I don't agree with you. That is your right. You can make a decision not to agree with anything that I'm preaching on. Ain't nothing I can do about that. My job is to preach the word the best way I know how and to hopefully preach it from what I am doing instead of just out of the book. And I'm telling you what, what Taffy and I know. We trust God for everything. Even when it looks crazy and impossible, and we've been in crazy and we've been in impossible. But wasn't nobody going to help us? Wasn't nobody going to reach out and do us like God? People will come to you and beg you for everything, and then when you completely go broke and ain't got nothing, they're going to act like you ain't existing. We have to trust God. We have to rely on God. We have to believe God where everything in our life is concerned. I can't do this without him. That's spiritual maturity. Spiritual immaturity is a guy who will allow his life now to be governed by his emotions and his emotions take him away from God, take him away from the will of God, takes him away from the things of God. And he gravitates more towards the things of the world. Are, is that you? Are you at that point where your intelligence, you try to lift that above the word? I mean, you can't tell some people something. Even, some, even sometimes when I'm preaching now, there, there are more people online trying to tell me how to preach it instead of just sitting your tail down and listening to what I'm saying. And it's like, how do you teach somebody that thinks they already know everything? And so, you know, right now in our lives, I mean, we'll be 40 years next year. And it's like we've been through a lot, but we still will not come to the place where we think we know everything because we know that spiritual maturity is always remaining teachable. It's always remaining a, you're as a student so that you continue to grow. I don't want to stop growing. I don't want to get to the point where 
I'm still saying what I said 40 years ago because I have ceased to grow and I've ceased to mature and I've ceased to allow the Holy Spirit to take me deeper and deeper into certain things that I understand. I am calling every world changer to commit your life to rely and to rest and to trust and to accept the truth that the Holy Spirit is your administrator and through him we move, through him we breathe, and through him we have our very being. But if you decide not to, oh well, ain't none of my business, man. My business is to teach you, to give you what I can, and then if you know more than me and Taff and everybody else, then, and you know, we do what we can, maybe it's time for you to cut off the stream and go somewhere else so somebody else can teach you something, I don't know. But I'm telling you one thing, I do know we're gonna stick with the Holy Spirit. Come hell or high water, we're going to stick with the Holy Spirit because I ain't never been to heaven before and I don't ever want to go to hell. But I at least want to know that I have a relationship with the one who's in heaven so that I won't walk right past him when I go there. I don't want to be so busy working for God that I forget to know who he is and have fellowship with him. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, look at this. You don't steal because that action reveals a lack of trust in God as your source. See where that comes from? That's the only reason people steal. They steal because they're hopeless, that it's just no other way that I'm going to be able to get money. And so they, they come to the point of I'm going to steal. Well, people ultimately steal because they don't accept or trust in the provision that comes from God. That's why people steal. People steal because they don't trust and, and, and believe God. People change their sex because they don't trust that God uh, has made them the way he wanted to make them. And, <laughs> and because of some things in their mind, they don't trust God anymore, so they trust what, you know, how they feel. You know, dear God, just think about it. If we did everything we felt every day, it would be chaotic. You know, what if you feel, felt like cutting somebody's throat? You can't do everything you feel. I'm going to go to the 80-year-old woman in the, in the line at the grocery store. I'm going to push her because I feel like it. You don't do everything you feel. Allowing your feelings to govern you, your feelings are unreliable. Why? They change. <laughs> they change. But the word does not change. And, you know, that time has come in, in that the Bible prophesies that, you know, men will call what's good bad, and they'll call what's bad good and there will be a, 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 a revolt against what's true and against the word and people will walk away from the word and people will stop preaching the word and they'll start preaching things that people want to hear even though it doesn't go with the word and I, I ain't do, I'm not doing that. I, I'm just not going to do it. I don't care. Listen, everybody, everybody can leave. I am not doing it. I'm going to stick with the word because I got to see Jesus. I got to stand before the Lord or the Lord and I got to give an account of what he told me to do. I'm sticking with the Bible. I'm not going to say, well, you know, I, I hear what you're saying, preacher, but that's old fashioned. People don't do that today. Listen, you better listen to me. The word ain't never going to be old fashioned. The word ain't never going to be outdated. The word that was true through 2000 years ago is true today. You're going to have to make a decision that lines up with the word or you're going to make a decision that you feel is an updated decision that doesn't line up with the word. That's where we are. Heaven or hell, man. Get grilled or get filled. It's your choice. It's your choice. What are you prepared to do? What are you prepared to do? How many more excuses are you going to make to be the same? You know, you might be 20 now and you might keep this this, this ridiculous mindset for the next 30 years, and you have lost your life listening and following fools. The Bible says a fool says in his heart, there is no God. Do you know how, you know how, how popular that is right now? I don't believe in that God stuff. And then they will quote, the reason why I don't believe in that God stuff is because that guy was supposed to be saved, but look at, his, look at what he did. And that guy was supposed to be saved, and look at, he failed. And that guy, ho, ho, let me, let me straighten out that right now. Let me straighten out that right now. Ain't no such thing as no perfect preachers. And that's a deception. A preacher is human just like everybody else. Yeah, but he should be held to a higher standard. No higher standard than what you should be held. <laughs> no, baby. 
And what happens is you're going to end up throwing away the whole thing, the baby with the bathwater, because of what the world says and how they treat things. Well, you know, oh, these people had moral failures. Yeah, yeah, they, you know, I don't know about it. I don't have a moral failure. In fact, everybody the Bible talks about that did anything great, they were broken people with moral failures. Ha! Oh, what, what you think you read? Pick somebody in the Bible. I'll show you their brokenness and their failure. Pick them. Well, I'm going to start with Adam. Oh, we already know what he did. Well, what about Moses, the great lawgiver? Put the murderer? Oh, well, what, about, what about David? He was an awesome man. Mm-hmm. Uh, was a peeping Tom, stepped out on his wife, had the husband killed, and then tried to lie to the prophet when the prophet came and confronted him. Huh? Who else you want to pick out? Well, 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 what about the apostle Paul? Seriously? Can you imagine what it was like when Paul got to heaven and recognized that most of the people up there, he killed them? God uses broken people. God uses people who were in the process of growing up. And we let the world, we let the world throw away your leaders and not want to have nothing else to do with them no more because we shame people with their mistakes and we condemn people with their mistakes. And the thing about it, the people who are doing the shaming and the people who are doing the condemning, they got a whole bunch of the same stuff they condemning and shaming folks with. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? Been deceived, man. Been deceived. Everybody should be in the process of growing. Everybody trusting the Holy Spirit to bring them to a place where they need to be. And if they should stumble at that particular place, let all the people get up and restore. The Bible says, in a spirit of meekness, let you who are spiritually strong restore somebody that got weak and then help them to get back up so they can continue to do what they need to do. You know what happens now? People who were spiritually strong and they got weak, nobody wants to be around them to pick them up and they never get back to what they were called to do. And we, we think we are doing something holy and something spiritual. You're not. And part of it is the preacher's fault, thinking that you're flawless, thinking that you're perfect, thinking that you're without sin or failure in your life. And then you put that upon the other people and have them look at you at the same way. Instead of sharing your life with people, your mess ups and your great things that have happened. But the gospel was given so we can infuse our life testimony within the scriptures. So it becomes a living gospel that people can relate to. Your transparency is an asset to the body of Christ. It's not something to be ashamed of. It's an asset to be able to say, I know what you're talking about because I've been there. Somebody, Jesus didn't do it. You know, Jesus told us, he says, I am touched with the feelings of your infirmities. Jesus says, I know exactly what you went through, especially even where disbelief is concerned. He said, don't you know I wanted to call legions of angels to come to my rescue, but I had to trust that what God was sending me to do had to be done. And then he said, nobody didn't put me to death. I laid my life down. I need to let you know, you didn't take it. I laid it down because I trusted in God. I, I sweated blood because I trusted in God. I could have called the legions to come to my rescue, but I didn't. And I know we feel the same way. Sometimes we feel like, well, you know, I could have did this, I could have did that, but Jesus said his greatest temptation was to do that and not trust and rely on, on God. You, you want to see how that works? I think I got enough time to, to show you that. Uh, a couple of things in, yeah, Matthew chapter 3, 17 and Matthew 4 and 3. The real temptation for Jesus was not to turn the stone into bread, but the real temptation to Jesus was to not trust in God, that God knew what he was going to do and do something differently to what God told him to do. Look at this. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, now notice what he said, this is my beloved son. Underline that. He, God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Now look at Matthew, going down to verse 4 and 3, I believe. Matthew 4 and 3. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God. Now what did God just say? This is my beloved son. This is my beloved son. So Jesus says, 
I trust, I, I, I trust that I am God's beloved son because he says I am his beloved son. He says, if thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. He says, now, if I turn these stones into bread, what I'm doing is I am saying that I don't believe what God said about me. I don't believe God said, thou art, this is my beloved son and whom I will please. Satan said, if you really believe that, turn the stone into bread. And Jesus said, I am not going to do that just to prove to you something I already know. <laughs> I'm not going to just do, I'm going to turn these stone into bread because I'm going to show you that I really am the son of God. Now, when you, when you know who you are, when you believe what God has said about who you are, it doesn't require you to produce any kind of evidence for somebody else. That's what we're on the world today. We're still trying to produce evidence for somebody else that we really are who we say we are. And the worst thing in the world right now, the biggest enemy to the grace of God is cynicism. The cynic doesn't believe anything that you say or do. The cynic looks at you and say, you can't be like you say you are. The cynic is always going to be like that. So I love what Taffy said this morning. So why allow the cynic to live in your space, in your head, rent free? I'm not doing that. I believe that I'm the righteousness of God. I believe that I'm redeemed. I believe that I'm sanctified. And it does not require me to produce some evidence for you, for me to prove to you that I am who God said I am, praise God. So what was the temptation? The temptation was not tempted to turn the, the stone into bread. The temptation was to disbelieve or to not accept what God said or to, to really prove to this guy, wait a minute, you don't even know what you're messing with. Imagine the temptations God, Jesus had to go through. Imagine the things he could do like, bam, just like that. But he had to walk as a man so that it would be fair for a man to be able to do what he did. If he did one thing, one thing that a man could not do, then it would have messed everything up. And I'm going to tell you one thing he did that a man can do, and we still don't get it. Jesus walked on water. Jesus walked on water. And you still saying it's impossible to do that. And yet there was a man that walked on water. Jesus walked on water, and then Peter walked on water. Jesus walked on water, and Peter, yeah, but Peter fell. Yeah, but before he fell, he walked on that water, didn't he? You ain't never walked on no water. I tried it. Yes, that ain't an easy thing to do. But God is showing us the possibilities of what can happen when we begin to trust and rely on the Holy Spirit to begin to do some things that we can't do in our natural. We got to live a life trusting God. We got to live a life trusting in the Holy Spirit. We have to live a life knowing that God is well able to take care of us. That's what living in this New Testament is about. Allowing the Holy Spirit to administer the things that are promised in the New Testament. Allowing the Holy Spirit to work in us, to change us, to give us the desires and the power. The Bible says he will give you the desire to please God and the power to carry it out. That's who I'm trusting. And so I need you to think this morning, who are you trusting? Who are you trusting? Are you trusting your education more than, than the Holy Spirit? Are you trusting your self effort than more than the Holy Spirit? Have you been thrown back into self-preservation where you are doing what you can do to preserve yourself? Won't you trust God? Won't you trust him? This is a perfect time to trust him. With everything that's happening in your life and everything that's going on, it would be so good to know that you're trusting him. And every day you wake up, Lord, I trust you today. Every day, Lord, I, I need you today. Every day, Lord, help me with my mouth. Help me with my attitude. Help me to love what's not lovely. Help me to get over this thing that I'm giving, giving space to in my mind. Help me. Help me, God. I trust you. I need you. I depend on you. And then begin to praise him all day long. Every time something comes through and you know it was him, oh, God, look at him. Oh, God, look at him. And you wake up happy and you can't figure out why you're happy in the middle of a crazy situation. Oh, look at Jesus. Oh, look at God. And then he's worthy to be praised. And then you praise him. 
and in the middle of hurt and in the middle of pain, in the middle of somebody dying, you don't understand why and you miss them and it hurts you so bad. And yet you realize somehow you're making it through. Somehow I feel okay. Somehow I'm hopeful. That comes from him, your unseen partner, the administrator of this New Testament. Trust him today. Trust him today. And if I said something today that offended you, that you didn't like, take it to God. Pray for me. Ask God to give you a greater understanding for it. I wish I can articulate every verse perfectly. I wish that all my teachings were flawless and perfect. But like you, I need the Holy Spirit to help me, to continue to develop me, to mature me, and to be like Micah. When I rise, when I rise, or when I fall, I shall rise. When you fall, you shall rise. Why, wow, the Holy Spirit's there. The Holy Spirit's there. Father, we thank you for this word today. Simple, but yet something we got to get, something we need to get, something I pray that we want to get. I pray for every house church today, every man, every woman, every family, every marriage, all the children, all the teenagers, that your spirit like fog, like a cloud will invade every household. Let them know that God is with them and he will never leave them nor forsake them. Let us operate in this unseen authority and power where people have to ask, what are y'all doing? How did y'all do that? How did that happen? And we will give glory and praise and thanksgiving to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are his majesty, the king. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, right now, there may be somebody who joined us today. You've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. You know, we've got, we're nearing 3,000 people who've gotten born again from just saying this simple prayer. Isn't that amazing? 3,000 people in the midst of a pandemic that's given their heart to Jesus. If you're not born again, and if somehow you left God, and somehow you bought the lie, just like Adam and Eve bought the lie, and today you want to make him the Lord of your life, say this simple prayer after me. Heavenly Father, I realize that I'm a sinner, but not right now I repent of all my sins. I make you the Lord of my life. I believe that Jesus died for me and was raised from the dead and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Come into my heart, be my Lord, be my Savior. And so right now by faith, I receive you as my Savior. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, praise God. Congratulations for praying that prayer. Welcome to the kingdom of God. And if you prayed that prayer with me, I want you to Text the keyword, I'm saved. That's one word to 51555. Provide your name and your email address, and we'll send you a free ebook as a gift to you today. And welcome again to the kingdom of God. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. It's offering time. And let me tell you something about offering time. In the midst of crazy things going on in the economy, you know how we've made it? We give unto the Lord. We give to God and we do that in faith, knowing that when we give to God, he gives to us. We believe that and we've always done that. And, you know, it's important that you trust the seed that you have in the ground. You have given, you have worshiped God with your gifts. Sit back and watch God do some great things in your life. And so we give out of gratitude. Thank God for provision right now. When you give today, give thanking him for provision. The Bible talks about blessings. We're already blessed. We're not giving to be blessed. We're already blessed. So give in thanksgiving that you're already blessed. Give today as a worship to the Lord. 
And as you give as a worship to the Lord, when people look around and seeing that you're being provided for, they want to know what happens. Say, I'm a giver. I give. I plant. I worship God with my, with my offerings, and he takes care of me. And God said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor is seed begging bread. God will take care of you. And so at this time, if you're ready to complete your worship and give to the Lord, as you've been doing throughout this entire pandemic, and notice God has been taking care of you throughout this entire pandemic. I know world changes. It doesn't take much to convince you because you, you just keep doing it. And I pray in Jesus' name that you will not experience a day in lack. God will take care of you. If you're giving by text, you can text world changers, space, and then the amount to 74483. If you're calling in to give, you can dial the number 866-477-7683. You can also go to our website, the World Changers site or the Creflo Dollar Ministry site, and you can give there online. And you can also mail your gift in to 2500 Burdett Road, College Park, Georgia, 30349. Rejoice. Rejoice over your giving. Let it remind you of what God has already done for you. And give with joy and gratitude and not with a grudging heart. All is well with you, World Changers. All is well with you, in Jesus' name. At this time, let's check out this week's announcements. Hello, World Changers Nation. As we approach Thanksgiving, with many of us planning to spend time with our loved ones this week, think about all that God has brought you through this year. Hmm, that's a lot. Now, isn't God great? We are especially thankful for all of you and your continued commitment to tune in each week to hear a fresh word from God. Now, we value you, our online community, and want to keep you in the know. Now, here are the latest happenings and announcements. Now, be sure to join the Radical Women's Ministry Tuesday, November 24th at 7 p.m. for their virtual Women's Fellowship. Now, you can connect via Taffy Dollars Facebook and YouTube pages. Now join them for cooking demos, crafting, and conversations around the Thanksgiving holiday. I mean, who really has the best greens? Hmm. <laughs> Go to TaffyDollar.org to get all the details. World Changers Nation, join us online this Thursday, November 26th at 10 o'clock a.m. for our Thanksgiving Day service. Now let's come together from all over the world to give thanks. You can stream online via Facebook, YouTube, our websites, or our TV app. You can even start a streaming party and join us as we celebrate as a family. Now we look forward to seeing you online. Are you looking for a place to show up and show off your acting, dancing, or singing skills? Are you gifted in graphic artistry, teaching, or administration? Well, Children's Ministry has a spot for you on their team. Now sign up today by calling 770-210 5709. Yes, you can make the difference. We are here for you every Wednesday and Friday at 10 o'clock a.m. and we host our weekly community food giveaway at our College Park campus. Now we look forward to serving you and your family while our supplies last. So call 770-210-5700 for more information. Since our church has gone completely virtual, our ministries have had to change how they're operating. And today, I have an update for you from Partnership. Now, they've gone completely digital. Now, if you are a partner, you can now access your monthly partner letter through the exclusive partner portal, as well as download your free monthly message. Now, if you are the 2020 Vision Partner, I don't know what you're doing, and you would like to become one, you can visit www.creflodollarministries.org to join and click on the word partners at the top to start your partnership journey today. And we'll see you in the portal. World Changers Nation. The World Changers Music Department is looking for people who are excited and passionate about worship. Now they're hosting video auditions for new vocal talent. Now email your one minute video audition to WCMG at worldchangers.org by Tuesday, November 24th for consideration. We can't wait to see, uh, hear you there. Get it? 
Now, if you haven't already, be sure to stream Creflo Dollar's newest sermon songs album, Mastering Your Emotions. Music created to help you take authority over your emotions. Now, it's available now on all streaming platforms. You also can get your copy right now, right now, with a gift of any amount by texting Sermon Songs to 51555, or you can simply visit sermonsongs.com. World changers, we will be home for Christmas. That's right, we are looking forward to joining you in your home via live stream at 10 a.m. on Friday, December 25th. So make plans now to join us on Christmas Day for service as we celebrate our Savior. Now, while you're marking your calendar, don't forget to set a reminder to also join us for New Year's Eve service as well. Now, we will be streaming live on Friday, December 31st at 10 p.m. And this is a New Year's Eve service <laughs> you don't want to miss. World Changers Nation. Don't forget to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter this week. Now give us your testimonies of Thanksgiving and tell us how God has blessed you this year. Now we want to hear all about it. You can always call us at 770-210-5700 with any of your questions or concerns. Now sharing is caring, so be sure to forward today's message to friends and family. And you know what? Happy Thanksgiving, World Changers. God, just so, 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 so thank you for you turn, tuning in this week. We know it's going to be a great week and um, all is well. It's going to be a great time with your family and friends and just be an expectation that um, burdens are being removed and yokes are being destroyed. If somebody tries to invite you to their pity party, just say, hey, I, 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 I love you, but I, I can't go there with you. God's been too, too good. And let's hang on to the word. Let's hang on to it for dear life. And we're just believing that your families are just going to go to another level and we're going to experience God's goodness. Yeah, it will if you make a decision to. But decision is the open door into reality. It will not become a reality without, first of all, making a decision for it to, to happen. So, amen. amen. Well, remember, uh, we are going to have our regular online Wednesday morning and night services on Wednesday but we added an extra one hour service on this coming Thursday, Thanksgiving. We wanna to celebrate together. So if you can take the time to just join us uh, virtually for one hour as we uh, you know, encourage you, minister some word to you, and um, just get you ready for that, that whole day. And, we and that's Thursday at 10 a.m.? That's Thursday at 10 a.m. Mm -hmm. uh, in the morning. And uh, so we're looking forward to it. Well, we love you guys. Um, I ask that you pray for the Falcons today. Uh, if you hadn't prayed for them, just don't do whatever you did the last couple of weeks. Amen. Just stay, keep, like uh, Taffy's daddy said one time, you know how we turn in church and we minister to one another and you turn and you ask them, you know, would you like to be born again? Would you like to be saved? Her, her father was uh, at church one time and the guy turned to him and asked him, do you want to be saved? And and uh, Pops looked at him and said, just, just wish me good luck. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he went on and buys business and everything. So wish the Falcons good luck? I, I'm, wait, I, don't, I don't want them nobody to do nothing that they didn't do when they won. Just keep everything the same. Just, just keep it the same. Well, Amen. good luck. Good luck, Falcons. No, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. We're just going to keep it just. Keep the same? Keep it the same. So if we didn't do anything, don't do anything different? Yeah, don't do nothing different. Okay. All right. Anyway. Your, 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 we pray for your protection and your, um, just all the things continuing to stay in a place of divine healing and health and wholeness this week. You're covered. Psalms 91 you equipped. You are covered. Amen. Yeah. Long life, heirs of God and angelic protection as you travel and all the different things. Angels go before you and keep you safe. Amen. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the almighty God be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. And everybody said, amen. amen. Have an amazing day. We'll see you soon.